I'm not terribly pleased that climate change has to stay. So I hope that during this panel we can discuss some questions that could help us move with this, with the, this important topic uh, uh, further. I'm Yelena Angelis, and I have a pleasure to uh, moderate the panel Societies in Transition Crisis of Earth. I come from Stockholm School of uh, Economics, and I'm part of that thematic area in, in Civica. On the screen, you see a couple of projects that were funded through Civica research calls. And I'm very pleased that uh, in the introductory talk, it was mentioned that this is just the beginning. We very much view this project as a seed project, and hopefully all or some of them will lead to a larger project applications, further developing these ideas, and bringing even bigger impact of that research on the topic of uh, climate change. Here with me uh, today, here and online, I have uh, three speakers. Florian Weiler uh, from uh, Central European University, Associate Professor at the Department of Public Policy, very much focusing on uh, climate policy work and international uh, diplomacy, will be our first uh, speaker. Uh, welcome, Florian. Dora uh, Piroshka, uh, also from Central European University, but from a different department of international relations, uh, where she works as an assistant professor and um, her focus is really on political economy of banking and finance, very much focused on uh, Eastern and Central European regions, uh, looking into the development banking on national, regional, and uh, European level. You might start wondering already, totally different fields, what do they have in common, but they do actually. So you will hear from the presentations that there are connecting points. And online, I hope we have Valentina Bosetti from uh, Bocconi, Professor of Environmental and Climate Change um, Economics. Uh, Valentina also worked at uh, Stanford University and Princeton University and uh, doing a lot of interesting research in the environmental uh, domain. And the rapporteur for our um, uh, panel will be, uh, or is, um, Ireri Hernandez Carballo here in the audience, a PhD student from Bocconi. So she and other rapporteurs of this conference have a uh, fantastically challenging task of uh, summarizing key points and answering a very important questions from the panel. So the drill is very simple. We'll have about 20 minutes from a, a presenter. We'll have five minutes for you, for us all to ask some questions on a particular presentation. And after the three presentations, I'm reserving 15 minutes for a uh, general discussion of the panel on some topics and taking more questions uh, from you for all three uh, speakers together. So with that, Florian, if you can stand. Yeah, hello. Um, can you hear me? Good. So we decided to stand. Um, that means I have to hold this microphone. So if I forget yeah. during the talk, then just alert me of it. Um, where are my slides? Do you know? Yeah. Sarah is here to help. Sarah? Uh, you press something. Yeah. I think I got, got rid of the... Oh, okay. Ah, oh, you just attached all the slides to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to uh, present to you our project here, which about, is about digital climate diplomacy. Um, and we are particularly focused on, focus on these small island states and how they behave um, on Twitter. You can see we are quite a few people. We have Carola Klöck um, from Sans Po Paris here. Then it's uh, me and Petra, who is also here in the audience from uh, CU. And we have a PhD student also from CU Timur um, Alessandro from the University of Turin. Uh, no, not Turin, sorry, what is it? Venice, Venice thank you very much. Um, and we also have, have uh, Carson Makonga, who is a student here at Sans Po Paris. I don't know whether he's in the room, I don't see him, so, uh, but yeah, so we have two people from Sans Po Paris here. Um, so let me uh, tell you just, oh, okay, there's one other thing. Um, of course, I am aware that these days it's not called Twitter anymore, but, um, I don't care, I'm gonna call it Twitter throughout this presentation. 
So let me tell you something about this, this Dana project that we've been working on for um, about an, a year now. So our idea is to basically um, explore a little how these uh, small island states behave on Twitter using um, a combination of uh, text analysis and uh, social network analysis. Um, we are partners from these three institutions there, Sciences Po Paris, um, HHS Stockholm and the CU. And I mean, if anything the project has done already, it brought these kind of very different researchers together. We are political scientists, network scientists, but also economists. And one very interesting thing for me, for example, has been, so I've been doing network analysis for quite a while, but I realized I have a very different understanding of what network analysis is than, for example, what Petra has, right? So I had always in mind these inferential network analysis, like, I don't know whether you know the terms ergam or sounds. And uh, now in this project, we did something completely different, which I didn't even aware, uh, wasn't even aware, aware that it existed. So we uh, were able to have cooperation across different disciplines, but also I think that in our project we have this cooperation across these civic themes, so on the one hand crisis of earth, uh, climate policy, me and Corolla come from that direction, but also the data-driven technology uh, where Petra and some of the others are coming from. So I think we are bridging quite interesting um, yeah, disciplines here, um, and it was certainly very valuable for me, this new cooperation, and I hope also for the others on the team. Now, more related to um, the paper that I'm presenting here, which is coming out of this Disdena um, project, um, it's only a starting point, right? So we have quite a few things in which di uh, direction we could develop this project from here, but I'm going to tell you where we are standing at the moment. So um, Carola and I, we've been working on climate di diplomacy for a long time, for more than 10 years now. We have published quite extensively together. Um, and we've been analyzing how small countries, but countries in general, uh, behave during these uh, international climate conferences, right? And now, over the past couple of years, we, of course, realized that Twitter is becoming more and more important. Now, how that de develops, we don't know now that everything's changing on Twitter or X. Um, but in the past couple of years, um, that became more important for um, negotiators for uh, diplomats in general, right? But no one really took much notice of that. Um, so we kept analyzing the negotiations without going into detail what they are doing on Twitter. So we did realize that there is strong variation. Some of the negotiators are on Twitter and very active. Others aren't at all, right? Um, and that wasn't really analyzed, at least, at least not by us. And we also didn't really know what they are doing there on Twitter. Does that have any relationship at all to the physical negotiations that we were looking in, into? So um, this is our starting point. Um, and so for this project, because we of course only have limited time, we decided to focus on these AOSIS countries. If you don't know what AOSIS stands for, it's the Alliance of Small Island States. So basically these 39 um, usually very small countries in the middle of the sea somewhere. So they are forming a climate um, alliance, a climate coalition, and they negotiate together during those climate uh, negotiations to pool their resources, to pool their power. Um, because otherwise, you can imagine these very small island states are not very powerful, but they have been able over the past 20 or so years to um, exert quite a bit of influence on these negotiations, right? And we wrote a paper about 10 years ago um, about how they are doing that and why they are successful. And this is kind of a continuation um, of this type of work. Um, and yes, they are also quite heavily present on Twitter. So what they are doing there and how they behave there and how they are um, basically um, yeah, seen by others on Twitter, this is the central stage of this project. So, um, what are our methods? So, first of all, we try to identify the most important key negotiators of these AOSIS countries. Um, and we did find of the 189 key negotiators that we identified, that 38 of them are on Twitter, in addition to the overall, the most important AOSIS chair Twitter handle. So, altogether then, we have 39 uh, Twitter handles that we um, were able to, to identify and then also use for our analysis for this project. Uh, we downloaded the entire timeline for these 39 accounts from January 2010 to January 2023. 
Um, now maybe you're aware um, of that, that since then um, a lot has changed. So researchers do not have free access um, to Twitter anymore. You can't download all the information for free anymore. So we are kind of left with uh, what happened until January 2023 um, and not what happens afterwards. But still, I think we have enough data to, um, yeah, for an, an interesting analysis until that point. Um, and then we started classifying these posts and working with um, the data that we obtained from there. And uh, we basically at the moment have three separate kinds of analysis. We have an overall mapping of the activities of these negotiators on, twi on Twitter. Um, then we have a more qualitative exploration of the content um, of what they are doing um, on Twitter of selected tweets. And then we have the more quantitative analysis of the interaction and, and engagement that these uh, Twitter handles um, are having on Twitter with other accounts outside of these uh, 39 accounts that we have identified. So I'll start with the mapping activities. I'll just show you a couple of the results that we have. What we don't know at the moment is how we bring these different strands that we have found um, together into a coherent project. So that's where we stand at the moment, but I'm gonna show you the, the results that we have so far. Um, so, of course, this is work in progress, right? Um, so, overall, we see that um, there's quite some variation, right? These uh, 39 Twitter accounts, some of them are very active, as you can see. So, some bars are very high, and but for others, some of them are very important, like Ian Fry there, for example. Uh, he plays, or at least some years ago, he played a very central role in the negotiations for the small island state of Tuvalu. Um, he's not all that active on Twitter while others are very active. The important thing is maybe also that here, our main EOSIS handle, they are active. They, um, over the 10 year horizon that we identified here, they uh, tweeted about 5,000 times. They have their own uh, original tweets, more than 2,000. They also have quite a few retweets, replies and quotes. So there is some um, substantial activity there of that main Twitter handle on, um, on Twitter, as well as also some of the other uh, people that we identified, they are very, very active and some less so. So that's um, a first finding. We also see that over time, the activity clearly increased. So if you look back 2011, 12, there was relatively little activity yet. And the closer you come to today, the more activity you see on Twitter of these Twitter handles. You also see that um, during the COPs, the conference of the parties, which are usually towards the end of the year, that there is somehow an increased activity of these Twitter handles, but it's not really standing out very much. But there's a little more activity during these times when the conferences are actually on. Um, then we had a look and delved deeper into these tweets and saw that um, and, and checked how many of these tweets are actually related to climate change. Um, and we see that, yeah, about a third or a bit less than a third maybe are related to climate change. But of course, these are often private accounts, so these uh, negotiators, these diplomats, they also tweet about other things and not only entirely on climate change. change but there is some, quite a bit, um, overlap with the climate negotiations there. Um, so that was the first part. The second one is then, as I said, more qualitative, um, an analysis of the content that we find in um, those tweets. And I'll just show you a couple of um, examples here. So first of all, um, what we found already in that paper that we wrote about 10 years ago is that EOSIS is very good in making these demands during the climate negotiations. So making demands is one of uh, the negotiation tactics that we analyzed, both Carola and I, um, during our PhDs. Um, and that's something that uh, EOSIS used in the past quite successfully, right? And this is something that they try to translate now also to, to, to their behavior on, grid, uh, on Twitter. So if we look, for example, on the tweet here, on the, uh, this, you can't really see that, I guess, on the right-hand side. Um, so here they show, for example, where EOSIS, but also other negotiators from the developing world came together during one of these conferences of the parties. And they really made a demand there that a specific topic, loss and damage, should be taken up onto the agenda of the conference of the parties, right? So they made this demand during the conference and at the same time, they're also tweeting that out to basically tell the public out there in the different countries that 
might be listening into their negotiations that this is a key um, demand that this group and others are making at the moment. So they're using um, Twitter to basically show what they are doing during the negotiations. So there is a clear relationship there between what's going on on the ground during the conference of the party and what um, they are doing on Twitter. Um, another thing that they are doing also is uh, that they are showing that they are really active and not only active but also successful players during these uh, negotiations. So that's again something that we have analyzed a long time ago and I told you already that these small EOSIS countries are surprisingly successful during these negotiations. And on Twitter they talk about that. So for example again on the right hand side here they tell you that they know what ambition in the climate sense means, right? And that it was them who actually put onto the uh, plate, basically, of the negotiators, this 1.5 degree target that you probably all have heard of. It was them who put it on the plate first and who were able to basically put it into the negotiation text. So um, they are very successful and they also, you could call it brag about it um, on Twitter. Um, and yeah, are, I think, rightly so, so um, quite proud about this. Um, and finally, and that's something that's a little bit, uh, was kind of new to us, they also try to um, relate, on Twitter at least, the negotiations more back to how the islanders um, actually live, to the daily lives of the islanders in their home countries. So here again on the right hand side we see that, where again uh, they talk about loss and damage, and what that means in their home countries, like destroyed hospitals um, or lost schools, or also in this case, the brother of this person who, whose front yard is basically flooded, flooded regularly, right? So they try to relate directly this loss and damage and what this means for the people in their home countries. So that's something we haven't seen before that much um, when we look at the negotiation behavior on the ground. So this is something that we uh, find more now on Twitter and it's actually quite new to us analyzing these negotiations now for many years. So that was the second part. I'm coming briefly to the third part, uh, which is about the interaction of these Twitter handles that we identified, how they interact with other accounts, how they engage with other accounts. And this is more a quantitative part now again, um, using um, these, these um, text new text analysis or relatively new text analysis um, tools coming from our colleagues. So first of all, we looked at the number of likes that they get um, and that they get for um, different types um, of, of, of tweets. So you can't see that up there, but we have original tweets, multimedia and uh, tweets with uh, an U uh, URL in them. And what we see for basically all of our negotiators is that they have this kind of power law distribution, which isn't all too surprising. They have many tweets and they have a few of these tweets who get a lot of engagement and a lot of um, likes. And then there are many tweets that um, are yeah, not perceived or not seen at all, not liked at all. It's not too surprising, but we see across the field that we see that pattern when uh, we have at least more active Twitter handles there. Um, what we also see is that uh, the audiences that our different uh, tweeters have are quite different from each other. So they are not talking to the same audiences, but they are followed, it seems, or retweeted at least, by quite different audiences. Uh, we do this based on uh, cosine similarity, and our results here, you can see that uh, it's mostly this kind of yellowish color there. Um, that means that the audiences of all these um, retweet us, or the audiences of all these uh, Twitter handles that we have identified, they are very different from each other. So they are not talking to the same audiences. Only some of them, you can see down here, are in blue, so there is some overlap here. I have to talk to Timur, our PhD student, I do not know why all of a sudden, so this, he sent this a few days ago, and our main AOSIS Twitter handle is not included here, and I don't know why, but I, we didn't have time to, to go into that and, and change that. So that's Something missing in that graph, uh, which in future versions, of course, uh, of the paper hopefully will be included again. But overall, we come to the conclusion that they are talking to quite different audiences. Um, however, when we look at the audiences in a different way, so where they stand on climate policy, then we see that they are again relatively similar. 
So they might not be the same people, but they all kind of fall into that, uh, in the, on that spectrum into the activists and not the nihilist spectrum, and they also are much more left-leaning than right-leaning. So here we see again quite a bit of an overlap um, of these audiences um, that follow or retweet or whatever, interact somehow with the identified Twitter handles there. And finally, if we look into that in a bit more detail, then we again see it doesn't really matter whether we look at mentions, quotes, replies, or retweets. We see here these box plots that on average, as I said earlier, most of the people in the audience are um, on the activists' um, side of the spectrum. However, we can see that some of the most important Twitter handles, like the AOSIS Twitter handle, um, then this is also a very active Twitter handle, uh, and also up there, Ronnie Jumeau, that they have, at least when it comes to replies, they also have quite a bit of interaction with uh, people from the skeptic side. So more and more we see that interaction that it's not only activists, but also, especially in later years, the skeptics come in and there is more of an engagement between the two sides. Um, but overall, it's still um, relatively uh, scarce that something like that happens. So most of the people that interact with our Twitter handles are more, much more on the activist side. So, um, yeah, in conclusion, so these are the findings and that's where we stand at the moment. It's, as I said, work in progress. We have to find a way forward. We have to think about how we can align those different three uh, strands of uh, findings that we have at the moment and combine them into a coherent uh, and interesting paper. Um, we also think about, with the people in Sweden, how we could um, continue this project. Um, so, any suggestions, um, comments are highly welcome, and thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. Um, time for a couple of questions, if um, the audience, and I have to give the mic, right? Oh, I think I can turn this here, right? Yeah. Is it on? It's not red. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the, um, for the presentation, a very interesting topic. I was just wondering if a lot of the results were kind of as expected, you know, very few tweet, they tweet at particular times, they tweet the same things that negotiators are doing. Was there anything that particularly uh, surprised you about the results? And one suggestion is you could also look at LinkedIn data because I see more and more people posting things on LinkedIn, people that aren't on Twitter and have problems with that platform, they post more and more on LinkedIn. So if you look at the LinkedIn data, that might give you extra um, views or even different views. Um, so it's just a suggestion. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So the idea with LinkedIn is certainly very interesting. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, regarding what was surprising, yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, nothing really stood out that I thought is completely new or surprising. But that can also be a good thing, right? It means it's a continuation of, of what they've been doing all along. And why would they behave completely differently on Twitter? Um, I mean, what did surprise me maybe a little bit is that um, they were tweeting so much also about their private lives, right? So these non-climate related uh, tweets. So that's maybe a little bit surprising. But on the other hand, these are also private people. So why shouldn't they? So, yeah. Other questions? Thanks a lot for, <coughs> for the presentation. I'm Giacomo Canzolari. I'm an economist at the uh, European University Institute. Um, uh, any difference between uh, uh, retweeting and, uh, let's say, organic tweeting? Uh, I guess, uh, no, it, it should be, um, to some extent, I'm surprised that I didn't see significant difference. Difference differences. between what, sorry? I think retweeting okay. versus original uh, content. In the interaction, you mean, that I showed in the end? Overall. So I I if you can go through across what yeah. you have seen so, so far. I mean, in the amount of, for example, likes that they generated, that wasn't a big difference. Where we did see a little bit of, an in of a difference was at the end, right, that the climate skeptics, they mostly interact with original tweets. So if there is a climate skeptic, they wouldn't really reply to a retweet of you but they would reply to an original tweet of, for example, the main AOSIS handle. Okay. So there we see a little bit of a, right, of a difference. Right, right. Uh, okay, so I yeah. think that is very interesting and uh, my view worth exploring. I mean, that, that's interesting, but also on the, yeah, if you think about it, not too surprising either, I would think. 
Because, I mean, if I retweet something or if I answer to someone, that usually doesn't really come up in the timeline as often, right? My original tweets, they come up in the timeline of other people much more often, uh, if I understand Twitter or in the past at least correctly. So it's not too surprising that the climate skeptics would jump on those original tweets, I think. Yeah. And they prefer not perhaps to expose themselves with their own ideas. I don't know. So <laughs> it's, it's just... Uh... <laughs> well, so I mean, now I would have to look into who these climate skeptics are, right? Often uh -huh. they don't really necessarily um, tweet under their own name. You know, on Twitter you can also be anonymous. Sure. Um, yeah. So we would have to make do an analysis now, but that could be interesting how many of these skeptics are actually um, posting under their real name. Yeah. So that might be interesting to look at. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. There was one, no more question. Well, I have a question. I, I read the paper, as, as you know, so, but you didn't put it on the slide. So what I read in between the lines is that there were, because of the limited size of a tweet, people are using different techniques on uh, using certain words. So what I was curious is whether you have observed or maybe whether it's interesting to see if you see a particular new vocabulary being developed that would or is used in climate negotiations. So no, um, the climate negotiations in general are full of jargon and the same is true, I think, for the tweets. So I didn't see a big difference there. But again, so we used, um, with the help of Petra and our PhD student, Timur, from, from network analysis, a lot of um, automated uh, methods, right? So we didn't go through all the tweets and read them all, but a lot of it was automated. So maybe also I just didn't notice. Yeah. OK, so thank you for bringing us the social media exposure. Now let's go to Valentina online. Uh. Sure, let me share my screen or, oh no, you're sharing, you're from, thank you for sharing the presentation with everybody. And Valentina, so, I will be your click. Yes. Just tell me when to click. Okay, okay. Uh, so thank you everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with colleagues uh, within the Steadfast project. Uh, the project was shared with the Central European University and uh, the European University Institute. But I'm going to present a subset of the work we've done, and that is on uh, diets. And that work was also, you know, was was done thanks also to the help of Sil Silvia Pianta, the European University Institute, and Elena Brutschin at IASA. So we can move to the next slide that basically tells you what are the motivation for our study. Um, although when we work on long-term projections to understand what is the impact of humans uh, on the climate, we typically work with energy system. More and more we realize that we should also work with food systems because they are responsible for a third of global anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions, mostly methane, but also partly CO2. And animal protein, we know, is responsible for uh, you know the largest share of emissions from food. So the idea is how do we understand what's driving dietary choices and how can we project them forward? So until now, projections of dietary, dietary demand and their related emissions have been based on the simple assumption that the larger the GDP per capita, the larger the demand, for example, for meat. Uh, we claim that this is kind of ignoring a lot of important factors and the work here is to understand what other factors are important and which of these factors can we project forward to get better projections. Next slide, thank you. So uh, these are the research, research questions we investigated, what drives meat demand, um, how future meat demand trends might look like, and can we do better than the projections uh, we have been seeing so far, which are kind of extreme and belong to two categories. One is, uh, as I said, as GDP per capita grows, then simply uh, meet the demand will grow uh, 
with that. The other extreme is everybody becomes vegetarian or everybody follows a planetary health diet. And, 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 and these extremes are, you know, both hard to believe as the, I mean, obviously they might envelop the truth uh, or the best projections, but they are kind of extremes. They serve the purpose of telling us how much can we save, but is it really something relevant if we know that we will never be able to push everybody to become, for example, vegetarian or uh, a vegan? So the next slide uh, shows you very briefly the methods we've used. So we want to develop more grounded projection of livestock demand. The basic idea was to read through the literature, which on diets, there's something in food economics, though it's a very small field. Then there is a, there is a lot of food science, though it's you know not only not always follows the dictact of science in the sense that mostly is funded uh, by or through money coming from the food industry, and not always uh, the acknowledgement uh, or the disclosure is full about this funding. Uh, and then there is a vast literature in anthropology, social sciences, demography, but also you know, medicine, looking at various uh, you know, drivers or implication of food. The idea that we started from this literature and the idea was to analyze uh, drivers, uh, a much larger set of drivers than normally used in empirical analysis based on this, uh, um, you know, the theoretical background. Now, obviously, we're not aiming for causality here. We really want to do the best possible prediction. So first we, we looked at traditional econometrics and then we moved to a multivariate random forest regression to search for the best possible prediction, trying to get a sense through Shapley value and other metrics of whether the model coming out of the, you know, the random forest uh, process was making sense and somewhat in line with the models uh, uh, developed through econometrics. And then we developed projections and there we could compare our projections with projections from AFAO and then project projections done traditionally by, the by integrated assessment models. Uh, please, can you please turn? So, uh, whether, well, you know, uh, drawing from this literature, we realize that uh, obviously this, you know, beyond GDP and prices, there are many, many other factors that move from uh, the urbanization rate or uh, the growth of urbanization to the level of education of the population, the level of in, uh, different metrics of gender equality, because uh, diets uh, m tend to be chosen by the uh, the woman in the households uh, the share under 40 uh, so there's a, a big element of the demography of a population on the choices diet choices and how conservative people are in their choices about the diets and then obviously other factors as for example um, you know, religious factors so please turn and turn again and so basically, uh, we, uh, I, I, here I wanted to concentrate on the various roles, adding uh, to the economic set of drivers, uh, social drivers uh, um, in the, so the first row only has economic factors. The second only has social factors. In the third year, we have all factors. And then the last uh, row, we have all factors plus fixed effects that basically represent some cultural traditions that are very hard to change. And we see that we really improve the uh, R square, the adjusted R square, much. Um, there is a big, you know, difference between pork, poultry, and all livestock uh, versus beef and sheep. And the big element there is that the beef is a substitute. So. If we don't account for the costs of other meat types, it's very hard to predict uh, uh, that well beef. So we can change slide again. And what you see here is for beef and for meat, uh, the, um, the importance uh, obviously positive here means uh, that it has a positive effect on the consumption of that, uh, of either meat in general or beef in specific. 
If it has a negative or null effect, of, of course, a negative effect on the amount of meat consumed. And what we see here is uh, some things that we would have expected. So GDP per capita is indeed the biggest uh, factor and it, it is indeed relevant, but other factors uh, are uh, also very relevant. For example, uh, the share of uh, uh, urban population and other factors uh, you know, might have uh, negative effects or re reduce the consumption of meat. This, for example, could be um, the level of gender equality. So with this set of, uh, with this set of estimates taken from past uh, data, uh, we started to move on projections and this is gonna be in the next slide. Again, so what you see here are four lines. I wanted to, um, I outlined, uh, outlined for you, sorry, it's our prediction SSP one in light blue and uh, two in green. And um, sorry for the typo. So the second hour prediction is SSP2. What are SSPs? These are shared socioeconomic pathways. This is something we use in uh, long-term integrated assessment modeling. It's basically some of the key drivers are projected forward per century. There's five scenarios, but here we look only at two scenarios. The SSP2 is basically business as usual. So the level of convergence, uh, the level of economic growth, the population growth range, everything is sort of uh, um, taking the past as uh, the culprit, whereas SSP1 is a sustainable scenario. So we have much more convergence across countries, um, much more uh, growth, though uh, so somewhat more growth, but uh, without necessarily having negative implication on the environment. But the key point here is that if we compare these two lines, the SSP1 and SSP2 lines that we produce with our models, to the other two projections, which are Remind and Message, we just picked two typical integrated assessment models, we see um, somewhat uh, large differences, especially for some countries, as for example, China or North America. So we see that our, that our predictions, uh, uh, our, our future prediction, they really do differ from the existing ones. Now, the next step is gonna be to understand or to evaluate the implications on emissions. So what was, what was this exercise done for? The basic idea of this exercise is that these models take for granted very simplistic assumptions about uh, how, you know, what are the future emissions, what is the future demand for meat? And in result, what are the emissions coming from meat consumption or the, foods, uh, the food system? Um, our idea is that uh, these extreme scenarios are not really, um, you know, um, that relevant because if you look at the projections that seem to fit better with the past and uh, for example the importance of cultural uh, fixed effects obviously has to be taken into account because we cannot imagine India going through a path with their level though the level of economic growth will keep going not necessarily we imagine them becoming meat eater as for example the americans so we need to take that into account and this is simply overlooking for factors that are extremely relevant so basically this is what we're going to do next put emissions um, and look at the implications for emissions and this is one of the two projects that um, uh, are coming out from the steadfast uh, project. Thank you so much. I'm here for questions. You can move to the next slide if you want. It's just uh, thanking you. It should be. The technology is not communicating with me, Valentina. But, oh, but the important fact is that you can still, you're still there and uh, alive and, and, and that's the only important thing. So questions from, uh, from the audience. I'm sure people now are evaluating their meat consumption here quickly. 
if you want, we can move uh, two slides forward. Oh, no, one, just one. And that's, I mean, that's, um, uh, this is the carbon footprint of food products. And uh, obviously people have in mind normally CO2, most of the emissions coming from the food sectors are coming, are methane emissions. There is a question there. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the talk. I was wondering um, how do you took the data to train your model, where the data was from? You probably said it in the beginning, but I'm not sure to, to have taken note of that. So please. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't actually mention where the data come from. Meat consumption, there's a few data sets. Uh, uh, FAO, FAO, sorry, has one. Um, most of it uh, traces back to the middle of uh, uh, last century. Um, then some of the variables are the, your typical ones. Uh, um, the big problem we have is the problem with the um, food prices. So it's a fine as long as we can, uh, as long as we get uh, a, a basket of you know of a uh, price a composite uh, price index uh, but then it is uh, more complicated to get country level the, all the analysis country level country level data of different types of meat the best uh, we were able to manage was to go back uh, until the uh, 80s the problem though is that when you the, the big problem here is that not only we want to have data in the past, well, we want to have some capability of projection, projecting data forward then. Hence, for, uh, there's a, a few models that have forward projection of, uh, or scenarios, mostly, uh, of scenarios of projection of composite, food composite index, but none that gives you specific meat prices for the future. And so what we did was to use uh, this composite even in uh, the projections of the past. Um, the other data set, the other data, sorry, projecting forward the other data, uh, we mostly are based ourselves on shared socioeconomic pathways. And these are data sets that is available uh, on the um, YASA database. Uh, I guess they also at this point gather all the data for the past, for, for example, um, population uh, level of institutions, et cetera. So they're gathering all this data because we also use them uh, for other uh, purposes uh, in data assessment modeling. But everything is there. Um, you probably noticed that there was a um, QR code at the beginning of this session. And there you can look at the uh, pamphlet on all the projects we produced. And within the pamphlet, uh, you find that fast uh, and uh, much more information are available there. Thank you. Any, yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I would have a question on the implications of your work. And I have the feeling that the slide that you put up last is uh, tending in that direction. but. I wanted to ask um, if I understood your projections correctly, what I would take from them is that one needs heavy taxation in order to force people to internalize the externalities of uh, the, the excessive carbon footprint of beef in particular. And so my first question would be, did you calculate how much uh, um, extra price should be put on beef in order to uh, achieve certain development goals such as uh, the fit for 55 or carbon neutral by 2050 mm -hmm. and or if we shouldn't just go for forbidding it simply forbidding eating beef thank you so I would actually not do none of the two because uh, most of the, I'm, I'm doing a survey now and there's few paper now out showing the uh, effect that, uh, that some badly 
thought uh, environmental policy had on the growth of populism in various areas, uh, um, including my own city and the um, road pricing uh, uh, latest measures. So I, I would not tax uh, uh, meat, nor I would ban meat. Uh, I think once we are aware of the problem with meat, uh, we should uh, uh, move forward in reducing emissions from uh, the food systems and there's way that uh, still allow people to consume meat. So we could think of uh, behavioral measures that uh, push people to have a better healthy diet, uh, uh, consuming less meat. Uh, but uh, I would uh, then urge, uh, uh, come up with policies that uh, if, uh, oblige producers of meat to reduce their meat and uh, production which means feeding cows differently and treating differently um, the manure, et cetera, rather than uh, uh, doing it uh, through consumers. Because that uh, would uh, really probably end uh, any possibility uh, to, to solve the climate problem. I mean, I would see then people becoming all of a sudden climate skeptic, at least in my country. There's a question here in the front. And if you haven't introduced yourself yet, I forgot to ask you kindly to introduce yourself. So I did. You okay. did, yes. Okay, so that's why you. I so remembered you were the only <laughs> one. <laughs> thank you, Valentina. Thanks a lot for the presentation. I have a, <clears throat> a, a small comment, and a, actually a question, a small comment on, on prices. I guess, uh, uh, as you already mentioned, it's quite difficult to project prices of meat uh, forward-looking 25 years. I just wonder if you can tell us uh, what, I if, what, what trend do you see in these prices? It would be quite interesting to know what, what, what is the projected trend of these prices and if there are differences across countries. And then the comment back to the previous question. Uh, I tend to agree with you uh, that uh, the, we have to be careful with policies, but the, the uh, picture you're showing us now clearly shows that there are significant externalities, uh, negative externalities in production mm -hmm. of meat that are not included in the actual prices of meat. Uh, so I don't know if you can, if you can and want to elaborate on this. Thank you. Thanks again. Yes, I think the, the second first, the, so we, we're now launching a, a European wide survey on what motivates people to eat less, what would motivate people to eat less. There's few, there's multiple uh, um, experiments that have been done uh, at, at this moment, mostly on the intention to consume red meat rather than the actual behavior. Uh, and most of behavioral nudges work very well on the food, uh, uh, on the food domain. Again, it's intention. And the, the, the arms, the treatment that uh, works the, the best uh, is the treatment that emphasizing the alignment between your health and the planetary health. So, and if you want animal welfare, uh, so this, uh, now there are huge, huge um, um, heterogeneity in how these treatments work in different types of the population. I'm uh, sorry, different um, demography, for example, uh, level of education. But um, so there is a lot that we can learn from this experimental literature on what works the most. And the main take home message to me is that uh, health is the lever. So if we convince people that it's for them, they do it, then it's maybe easier to have campaign that help people reducing their meat consumption. And never talking about uh, uh, bringing that to zero because that really shocks people, uh, but uh, pushing towards uh, lower quantities. That, that's already would, that's already, that already would be uh, a lot. In terms of future projection of uh, meat prices, uh, um, I, was, I didn't explain myself well before. We don't have that, it's very hard to do that. So we're constrained on that. Though we use individual meat prices by country in the regression, 
Then the last regression, the final regression we use has just the basket of food uh, price index. And that's the one that we project forward. And we use the data coming from the shared socioeconomic uh, pathway scenarios uh, to do that. But it's not meet by individual country future projections. We don't have that. Thank you, Valentina. Um, we'll now move uh, to Dora. And we need Thank the you. mic back here, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my name is Dora Piroska, and um, so I'm going to present uh, the preliminary result of a, of a preliminary research, uh, which we conducted together with Matthias Tiemann, who is sitting here in the room, uh, and also Alpa Todor for SNSP. Uh, and uh, so I'm coming from the CEU, and we are interested in banking and finance and evaluation, and uh, so we try to put uh, together these interests um, to, uh, to this uh, interesting and incredibly relevant topic of uh, climate change. And so we are going to look at, in this uh, short presentation, evaluating the EU's financial instruments for the green transformations, how fit they are. So the motivation of the research is that uh, Van der Leyen comes into the commission uh, and she declares in 2019 that the EU is going to be a leader in the, in the drive to, to decarbonize. Um, in 2021, uh, Fit for 55 is uh, launched as a, as a new program which would like to be 55% reduce carbon emissions by 2030 and set the goal of carbon neutrality very ambitiously to 2050. Right, so the EU really is serious about uh, fighting climate change according to this um, vision. And uh, the preferred instrument is what we are really after, what we are interested in, and that's blended finance, blended financial instrument. I'm going to define what we mean by that and what the EU means by that uh, just in a minute. Uh, primarily, the most important uh, characteristics that you should know about blended finance is that it works with a limited amount of seed funding from public institutions, and this, funding, this seed funding is used to leverage five, 15, 30 times as much private investment into certain publicly defined goals, right? So that's the, that's the idea of blended finance. It's blending private and public funding uh, for certain publicly defined goals. So the research interest uh, is this blended finance because we see a little bit of a paradox in the application of these blended finance for achieving the incredibly pressing goal of climate change, namely that it's incredibly difficult to evaluate the impact and measure the effectiveness of blended finance. And so it's a paradox not only because we are fighting climate change and it would be so incredibly important to know how our chosen and, select and most promoted policy tool is actually effective, but also because we live in the era of evidence-based public policy in which there is an internal logic of policy making which is demanding more and more evidence to be put as input into evaluating the effectiveness in terms of actual numbers, and then the, the instrument at hand is actually doesn't allow for that, uh, for that too much. So, so why not? Why, what is so problematic with, with blended finance? And that's basically our research, and we are at the very beginning of it, and it's a qualitative research, so we are very much interested, you know, continuing further with more quantitative data. But basically, we are looking at three things. So one is the legal nature of blended finance that I'm going to talk about in just a bit. The, the second one is the EU's own institutional structure within which evaluation of EU funding is carried out. And the third one is other actors in the financial sector and outside who also put quite a bit of effort in evaluating the impact of these bandit financial instruments, there are important gaps in what they are able to observe and what they are able to evaluate, and there is very little communication in, uh, among them. So all together, we have a major problem that blended finance is the preferred instrument, but it's incredibly hard to evaluate. 
So the nature of blended finance, I promise I'm going to tell you more. So in the EU legal regulation, blended finance takes the legal form of financial instrument, such as loans, guarantees, equity, or quasi-equity quasi investments with possible integration with grants. So you can see that most of them are repayable loans in various format, in various um, uh, capacities, often provided by banks, but often securitized in a sense that uh, certain trenches of the financial instrument is publicly financed, but then other trenches with different risk return profile, right? If we are bringing in private finance, they are here for the profit, but they are also evaluating what is going to be the risk and what's the return of their investment. And all these included into one single instrument. Right? So I'm, I'm trying to explain here the complexity, both in terms of legal rights and obligations, but also in terms of risk and return of what elements of financial investment is used to fight climate change. So in practice, financial instruments uh, are combined in addition with you know, this technical uh, financial engineering, with technical support, interest rate sub subsidies, and guarantee fee subsidies, which come on top of the already relatively complicated legal uh, instruments that further complicate the evaluation of their effectiveness. And so we conclude that financial instruments, nature is incredibly fluid. This is between an interest-bearing loan and a quasi-subsidized grant, right? Okay, so if you are with me, uh, I'm going to show you here some numbers. Uh, this is going to be a bit boring, but I really would like to shock you with the, with the amount of money which is envisaged today by the European Commission to be spent through these fluid and complex financial instruments for the purposes of climate change. So we have InvestEU funds, which mobilizes 279 billion euros for climate-related investment. And this is promising leveraging a guarantee of, by, so this is to be achieved by leveraging a guarantee of 26.2 billion uh, euro of public funds with a factor of 125. So here you see the kind of the logic of the, the financial instruments. What the EU is spending is the 26.2 billion euro and all the other, the rest of it, is supposed to come from private investment with the, for the purposes defined by the EU. The same for next generation EU funds, recovery and uh, resilience facility. Here the EU is uh, uh, envisaging to spend uh, 729.23.8 billion uh, euro on financial instruments and out of this 37% uh, is going to go for uh, climate uh, action. The same for European structural and investment funds. Here 30% uh, is envisaged to be uh, used for climate action and all the amount is in the form of financial instruments. Just transition funds here only the amount is uh, defined uh, in the EU documents, not the percentage of how much is going to be spent through financial instruments, but we can see that at least 30% is, uh, is expected. And finally, EU Green Deal's renovation wave and rep power EU initiative, all designated where the financial instruments are going to be the key policy instrument to carry this out. All right, so to wrap up a little bit why we have and <laughs> what's the problem with the blended finance is that this is a, this instrument is going to um, it's, it's promising if the EU decision makers the opportunity to mobilize way more funding than what's readily available to fight climate change, right? And we have to find climate change, otherwise we are going to burn, right? And finance is there, it's a global network, it's very operational, it really is just a little bit of tweaking that is, makes it effective. And if you think just a little bit about how incredibly finance is interested is that if the financial sector is financing something, it can work continue working. But if it stops financing, it cuts the, the funding, then that's it. 
no more. We don't have any more polluting industries, right? So in a way, I think this is really very, very interesting how we use this one and only really effective instrument in the hands of humanity to find climate change. So by being incredibly promising, it's also extremely hard to evaluate, right? It's going to be a incredible challenge to evaluate whether these blended finance instruments are going to actually deliver what we want them to deliver. All right. So, why this evaluation in addition for the nature of blended finance is so complicated in the EU? For that reason, we mapped out uh, the ecosystem of the EU, uh, within which, as you see in the middle, uh, evaluation of financial instrument is carried out. We identified ex ante assessment uh, institutions, the European Commission, member states and public authorities, and the managing authorities, and public development banks. We also identified ex post assessment, uh, such as, again, the European Commission carries out ex post assessment, the European Court of the Auditors, it's very important, um, the European Parliament has certain committees which also looks into the evaluation and the effectiveness of these instruments and um, managing authorities and civil society actors. And the next step, we also wanted to see how they communicate to each other and who is reporting to whom and how to really get a notion of what is exactly being evaluated. And uh, the title is coming from Matthias for this slide is the mind blocking complexity of the EU accountability regime. Because really there is an incredible complexity of uh, referencing and reporting. And as you can imagine, many of these authorities are really using different language and different uh, metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of blended finance. And we see it as an incredibly important hurdle in evaluating uh, blended finance. All right. And so the third reason that we identified in this literature review uh, why blended finance is so incredibly difficult to evaluate has to do with the non-EU actors or just partly EU actors, the multilateral development bank and civil societies. Uh, in the actual research that we carried out, we looked at the European Bank for Restructuring and Development, the EBRD, and Bankwatch, a civil society uh, organization, and looked at what exactly they are looking at when they are evaluating that the loans, guarantees, and other financial instruments deployed to do something about climate change, how they evaluate uh, if they are effective or not. To no one's surprise, the EBRD is looking at actual uh, performance data indicators, primarily in the form of physical uh, indicators. So the box I, so the, the box we created uh, shows you that they look at CO2 emission per activity data, water use per activity data, primary energy use per activity data in all of these metrics they would like to see you know uh, lower levels obviously uh, for more climate friendly activities post the blended finance uh, instrument and what we concluded is that EBRD has an incredibly narrow focus on material outputs and there is very little lack of connections to social outcomes. As opposed to that, we also looked at civil society approaches to, to evaluate. And the function of NGOs in evaluating blended finance is, we find three, is to seek to align a green projects with aspiration of local communities. So it's very nice that the, the coal mine in the village is going to be closed down, but what exactly the village people are going to eat, right? Well, right after the coal mine uh, being closed down. So, so very, very localized knowledge. They talk to the people, they come from these villages. They're really very uh, active. They also uh, perform a watchdog function uh, of uh, various blended finance instru uh, instruments using uh, banks uh, primarily and development banks, both commercial and development. And they're also very important in raising uh, awareness. 
And uh, so what we see is that they really have an access to a very unique data, right? They, they talk to people and they, they're very much interested in their, their social circumstances. However, this is also their limit, right? Because then they don't see the broader implications uh, and the broader consequences of, uh, of the processes uh, that, uh, that they criticize. So basically, what are our conclusions at this level of, of literature review? So our best chance to fight climate change is mobilize the financial sector. I think we should be very clear about that. Uh, there is no any other so incredibly developed and fit institution on this earth than finance, which can act quickly and swiftly and very effectively to penalize pollution. However, the preferred instrument, both globally and at the level of the European Union, blended public and private financial instruments, today have limited capacity to serve our societal goals. And this is, as we saw, is due to our limited steering capacity of these instruments, due to blended finance fluid nature, the complexity of the EU's accountability regime, and the major gaps in what is being evaluated by the different actors. So, we have two conclusions. We must better understand blended financial instruments through more research, so it would be nice to receive more funding for this research so that we can carry out. The second and the policy uh, implication is that the EU that we looked at must seek out new and innovative ways to mobilize private financial instruments to fight climate, to fight climate change. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dora. There's a question here in the front. Thank you. How did you turn it on? Thank you. One thing which was implicit in what you said is uh, who is benefiting from the support from the financial instruments. And I would like to connect this with the first uh, piece of information, but also something we see uh, appearing more and more, in particular in populist uh, parties, which is the challenge to the Green Deal. But one challenge to the Green Deal, which I really found very um, uh, worrisome for me, was uh, an alliance of uh, left-leaning uh, Czech parties, which recently uh, very put as one of their first priorities to fight against the EU Green Deal, because it was affecting too much the smaller uh, um, agricultural enterprises in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, implicit in what you said, of course, there is all these instruments, but who is benefiting? And um, how can one measure that? And how can one also use this information to fight this idea that uh, we cannot afford the Green Deal because the people who are going to suffer from measures which accompany the Green Deal are the socially less favored people, which could be true, actually, but uh, we need to understand that in order that the instruments are geared in the, in the right way. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this is absolutely along our line, and we would very much would like to continue our research along those questions that you just raised. So, so I just, I absolutely agree. I don't know if Matthias would like to say something to this. Just wait a moment. We need the mic so the online mm -hmm. audience is uh, involved. Thank you for this excellent question. Thank you for this excellent presentation. Uh, we, we start research initially wondering if it's not just finance, because it's of de-risking, where the public money comes in to de-risk private financial actors. And so that was our first worry, as in like, how do we make sure that it's not just private finance benefiting from these public millions and we don't even know what they, be what they actually bring about. As we did the research, we found uh, that indeed economists, for example, have great difficulties in evaluating the additionality of these measures, and this is the key term, additionality is the key term around which everything seems to um, evolve around. And in this context, we can see also some positive aspects. So there are, there's for example, an additionality and impact measurement monitoring framework, beautiful mouthful, by the European Investment Bank that seeks to measure what they do with their, with their measures in terms also of local social outcomes 
But then again, the question is, how does the EU, the European Commission, relate to that? And so I think our research should also be very much understood as a research on a field in the making. Because it's not done yet. This is 10 years old, 20 years old. They are evolving. And we know that the European Commission is very upset with, for example, the European Investment Bank and its capacity to deliver policy steer based on these instruments. And now is the question of how this struggle evolves going forward. And I think your question as to who benefits from these measures is really crucial. And in this sense, we really thank you very much for it. Thanks. Listen. Thank you for being active questioner. I'm addicted with questions. <laughs> so it's related to uh, the last comment you made. Uh, so I would ask you after what you have done in the, in, with this research, you showed us the complication of the EU system, assessment system. And if you had four moves or little uh, number of moves in order to improve the system, what would you do or more you know, directly? What would be the, uh, in your opinion, uh, the way to assess the impact of these policies? And then I have a more general question, which is, why do we need policies on the investment? So I mean, uh, we are talking about pollution, impact, negative impact on our environment. Why don't we tackle directly the negative outcomes? Why do we need to support? It's a provocative question. Why do we need to support investment rather than? Uh, you know, directly affecting the negative consequences of uh, what is actually polluting. All right, thank you so much. So, so obviously the EU is an incredibly complicated uh, evaluation system right now, and there is very little, you know, way of pointing out which institutions to strengthen and which one uh, to cut back, because in a way, what many EU integration researchers are pointing out is that there is a, there is a need of, of democratizing the EU you know, institutions, all of them in a sense of, of giving more um, diversity into their decision making. Honestly, even if it's too diverse, or so maybe you know, uh, advocating here something uh, that may not necessarily be an incredibly quick solution to, to, the, to the current complexity, but the current com complexity is an expert-driven complexity. It's, it's, a, it's a different kind of EU experts using different kind of metrics, and it's not a democratic com complexity which would involve more different level deliberations within these EU institutions. So that would be the kind of change I would, I would go for. And then your second provocative question I would like to answer with a different provocative answer is that even if you would like to phase out certain polluting institutions or polluting businesses, you need finance for that as well. So, so in a way, either for functioning, either for closing down, you cannot do it without the banks. And so, so in a way, the banks remain critical for the functioning of or incredibly polluting uh, industry. And the banks are, in my opinion, a very good target to change that, that overall polluting uh, system that we live in. Thank you. Um, now that our time is coming nearly to an end, we have about five, six minutes left. So I have a couple of uh, general questions to all of uh, three of our panelists. Um, and thank you for the audience. Some of uh, your questions were linked to the one I'm going to ask about how the research we at Civica and specifically in the projects that uh, you're involved in, how does this research brings or can bring uh, policy impact? So how do you see your research results or future research in that uh, domain um, bringing some policy recommendations for the European Commission or other actors in the, in the system. So whoever wants to start, please. And Valentina, thank you for putting the camera on. You're on our screen too. <laughs> so should I start? Sure. I mean, how would it lead to policy change per se? I mean, that's, a, that's quite hard for a single paper, I would say, but um, maybe let me, let me phrase it this way. So when uh, we did our research on these small island states a long time ago, um, there was interaction actually 
with some of these negotiators, and especially with um, the Potsdam Institute in, in Berlin, who were not all too keen on our research because what we found at the time is that uh, AOSIS had, had been very successful at the beginning and that their success over time slowly became a little bit um, weaker, their impact on the uh, negotiations, and they didn't want to hear that, right? Um, so there was kind of a lot of interaction actually with those negotiators who uh, for a while even tried to um, yeah, get our paper like um, unlisted, right? They didn't want this out there. Um, so, and I guess now we can show that they have, despite everything I just said, continued with their success now over the past 10 years, right? So just, if we can continue this research somehow, um, I think we could have another interaction with them and telling them you're doing the right thing actually. Maybe we were wrong 10 years ago by kind of um, proposing that their success might be weaker in the future still. Um, so, uh, and thereby encouraging what they are doing. I guess that might be one way uh, in which if we continue with our project, we potentially might have some policy impact directly by interacting with these negotiators. Mm. Thank but it's, of course, no guarantee. We need some funding for it. Yeah, yeah, but you understood why I'm asking this question. It's sort yeah. of we are putting forward our wish list from this thematic area on what we can develop further in, in civic research going beyond. Valentina, uh, from, uh, from the work in yes. your project. Um, yes, I, I, so I think the, the, the first, uh, you know, the, the, the research feeds first into the international uh, negotiation debate where we look at projections of emissions coming from different sectors and then claims are made on, uh, for example, what is the counterfactual future versus which I compute how much emissions am I re reducing or, or, you know, how much uh, emissions is my country going to make in the future within this domain, knowing, having a better sense of what the baseline emissions coming from this specific sector, which is the relevant sector, is important for countries. Um, and we see that some countries were extremely, um, the, the emissions coming from the food sector of some countries were exaggerated too much. Uh, um, in the second, the second step that I see is that this research helps us feed better a service that we might want to do to understand, uh, uh, you know, how much can we move uh, the population? What, are, what is our wiggle room to change the behavior of people? Um, so as I was suggesting before, I would not uh, um, think of policies that really are bans or uh, price policies. I would rather think of behavior policies in this context and producers policies. Um, Finally, uh, I think it is important to realize that there is an important demographic set of implications. Hence, for again, both to have to get the future pro projections that are important for policymakers, but also to uh, target better policies. Uh, different generations react very differently. Not only they have different rate of consumption, but they have a different rate of change in consumption. I didn't show you that part of research. So they can move more rapidly. When you're younger, you change your diet more rapidly. That happens, uh, uh, you know, whether you are uh, in your, remain in your country or you migrate. So I think all these are relevant uh, um, intuitions that can serve uh, policymakers in devising better, more acceptable policies. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Dora. Uh, thank you for the question. I think I told you already a little bit about the policy implications, maybe one more thing, and it's again, it's very selective, and it's, it's primarily because I'm myself working on development banking, but with, with Matthias, uh, there's really an, in, an increasing uh, interest from researchers on, on what public development banks doing, because most of the things I'm talking about, how these blended financial instruments are being mobilized, are through commercial banks, right? And commercial banks are tied due to their organizational logic, quite a bit to the mobilization of private finance through these securitized blended instruments. But public banks are not, right? Publicly owned banks can do otherwise. They are not so tightly linked to the, the global financial markets. They are tightly linked to the budget of their governments. 
So in a way, I think we could see the innovations in, in, in climate finance from state-controlled and state-owned banks. Thank you. Our time is up, but um, I usually try to make some funny connection of the panels I'm moderating, and that's not necessarily not for the, for the records. So one of the tweets that you've described in your paper, Florian, was, I don't remember which member of uh, OASIS uh, standing knee-deep in the water, just proving the point that some islands are being flooded. So the way I would summarize with the picture of our panel, if we're standing knee deep in the water by one of the small island states holding a big bag of nuts and a big poster saying no cow meat and hugging a person from a local bank agreeing to support our activity, maybe this way we can get more funding for this topic. So on that note, let's go and get some coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.